Hello, everybody, and welcome to Tips and Tricks Tuesdays with me, Valentina V. I hope you're having a lovely Tuesday. Ignore the whatever truck is outside my window. I have no control over the streets of Los Angeles. I am a filmmaker. Uh, I shoot, direct, edit, and I also am an Adobe Max Master Trainer, which means that I train people on video programs across all of Adobe's video apps. Today, uh, our discussion is gonna be around how to shoot and edit documentary videos. But before we get into that, I'd like to share this URL with you, adobe.ly slash tips Tuesday. If you go there, you'll be able to see the manual that I put together for this lesson so that you can follow along on the PDF. You don't have to take any notes. Also, uh, you can enter for a chance to win 12 months of Creative Cloud. Last year's, last year's, last week's winner is Omar Najam. Congratulations, Omar. You have won 12 months of Adobe Creative Cloud, the master suite. So again, that URL is uh, adobe.ly slash tips Tuesday, and there you will be able to uh, sign up and get all that, get it, get all those goodies, get all that good info. I'm also simulcasting for the fa first time to Facebook. So it's a little bit, I have like 50,000 screens around me and uh, we're doing our best. But enough of that. Uh, today we are, I am super excited because I have someone with me who I've admired for many years. I've watched his documentaries. Um, I follow him on all across social media. And this is a filmmaker who has a very particular, I would say, style to his documentaries um, and the way that he presents the information, the way that he presents the knowledge and his choice of subjects is also always very interesting to me. So I'm very pleased and happy to announce uh, my guest for today. Oh, hold on a sec. Uh, Alex Horwitz. He's coming through right now. Hi, Alex. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. How are you today? Doing all right. Surviving like all of us. Surviving, I would say thriving potentially we're doing our best over here for those people who don't know i feel like it's always difficult for me to introduce guests who are so many things and perhaps it is best for you to introduce yourself so if you could do me the favor of of giving us a little rundown of what you do sure i guess i'm a few things but the short version is i am mostly a documentary filmmaker based in new york um i was around production mostly on narrative Hollywood movies shooting in New York and very small jobs for a few years before I got my foot in the door, mostly at a company called Radical Media in New York City. And I was an editor primarily of documentaries uh, for about eight or nine years before I pitched and directed Hamilton's America, or what became Hamilton's America, which was a documentary on PBS that followed the creation of the musical. Um, and then my subsequent feature was called Autonomy, uh, a uh, car and driver documentary about self-driving cars, which uh, Malcolm Gladwell executive produced. Uh, so it's a little bit of a mixed bag. I, you know, did a music video for Bon Jovi shortly before the pandemic. Uh, uh, a lot of different documentary projects mostly, but a um, little of this, a little of that. I would say that the one through line through all of your projects is that they do need research, whether it is a documentary, whether it is um, a short form project, there's always the research that comes in underneath all that. How do you start your research process? Like, how do you even know, for example, for autonomy, who to even interview, who to even yeah. ask for an interview, how, how to even build the story? Yeah, that that one was a hard, it was a harder answer to those questions on that film in particular. You know, with, with uh, I'll, I'll answer in contrast to Hamilton's America, my first feature, yeah, it was about the biggest pop culture phenomenon of you know, of the decade, but it was a pretty straightforward story. I knew that it was really going to be about the life of Hamilton as seen through the show. I knew the creative team of the show, so I just had a very simple egg corn from which to grow the oak, and we just kind of sort of went from there. And I, if, if all I had done for research was read Ron Chernow's biography, I'd be okay. With autonomy, it, there was no lead character. There was no simple through line for it. It was just, you know, the lead character was 
an emerging technology, self-driving cars, like where do you start? So uh, I didn't know where to start. Uh, I tried to learn as much as I could uh, from an engineering standpoint. Um, and uh, Car and Driver was helpful as a resource. They were executive producers of the show, so they have a lot of literature to help out with. Um, and then I did work with a story producer, which I don't always have the luxury of, but on this one I did uh, for pre-production. I had a story producer, a uh, uh, wonderful researcher and producer named Sarit Work in New York. And she just kind of helped me make sense of it, uh, where we just said, okay, whom do I need to talk to? Whom do I want to talk to? How am I going to craft a story with people who are well-known in the industry, people who are average Joes and Janes? Um, and what are those stories going to be? And we were just kind of inventing it on paper, looking out into the world. I actually used something on that film I'd never used before, uh, nonfiction casters, who are exactly what they sound like. They just kind of put things out there on Facebook and various social media feeds and like I needed a an articulate blue collar trucker um, and they I, I didn't know any truckers and yeah you could have just called a truckers union but who knew who knew what you were going to get so they they helped me cast helped it was cast. that it was that lady yeah. that was yeah, uh, with with her with her dog right yeah who was amazing and I know, had I no idea her, okay I selected her from a short list that the nonfiction casters gave me I said this is the kind of thing I'm looking for the kind of position I'd like them to have just sort of checking some boxes and then they did what a casting agent does which is you know call the massive unknown into a few selections for me um in other cases you might have a clear person you want to go to like well it needs to be this person for that obvious reason um but yeah that one was a big definitely a big research push when you are talking to those kinds of people that maybe aren't media trained maybe don't know how to necessarily um talk during an interview don't uh, know how to give those sound bites what are some tips that you've developed over the years how to deal with people who are not media trained sure um well first of all you can find people who aren't media trained that have the right instincts that if you have that luxury on something like autonomy we found the trucker who i just knew was going to be good um even though she was not media trained um, but sometimes you have to speak to a particular person, depending on the story, and they are, as you say, not trained and, and maybe stiff on camera or just don't give you much. A uh, few things you can do. I'd say, first of all, and, and this is obvious, but it is the subtle art, not not a, um, not a science, you've got to try to put people at ease. Um, just be a human when you come into the room. Very often we have a big light, there's a big sheet of diffusion, uh, there's a giant camera next to my head. And you just got to kind of, you know, get up out of your chair, shake their hand, talk to them as if they're a person, which they are. And as you sit down, make a joke about it. You say, ah, no, just forget that this, this all isn't here. And you just, you, you be as off the cup as you can. You, you show them that they are in good hands. Um, and try, and this extends for the, the duration of, of the interview. It will get you good results, um, but it will also help put them at ease. Try not to be robotic. Try not to be, okay, first question. Great, thanks. Okay, next question. I mean, they're going to sense that. And and uh, the best ones are always the most conversational. And that's going to happen if you are at your most conversational. And then if they're still just not giving you answers, um, you do have to wear an editor's brain and just hear like, okay, do I, do I have a beginning of that sentence? Do I need to, and, you know, sometimes, yes, I'll go back and say, okay, I need you to just say it without the I or can you, you know, can you repeat the language of the question? Then you put that into an example. Sometimes I'll say, fill in the blank for me, phrase blank. And I'll say, repeat that and then just take it from there. Um, I always try to phrase a question um, with something like, tell me about, or what do you think about rather than something that could be answered with a simple yes or no. Do you, you know, is, is that? Um, try to make the language of your questions leading if you can. And then if you have to go back and mop up and ask for a little more phrasing, you can. A lot of that is dependent on active listening on yeah. Yeah. making sure that you know what your subject is saying and then you can work off of that and that's something that i've been um working on as well is there are certain points at which you maybe want to follow up that the subject just said and you have to keep them in mind in order to then uh bring them up again yeah. and that's that's difficult to do on the fly yeah i um depending on the interview i will or will not have notes in front of me I almost never have an, a list of questions. If it's a very short interview, because I know I've only got a few minutes with some high profile person, I likely have the questions memorized. Um, 
But if it's a longer interview, I probably just have bullet points just so I'm not sitting there going reading. I've, I've gone through my list beforehand and I know I can just very quickly glance down and know exactly where I'm going so that they don't feel me disengaged to read. Um, and then if, as you said, they, they say something I want to come back to, I will just scribble and I'll, you know, I've gotten pretty good at maintaining eye contact while scribbling some note. And it'll just be some shorthand thing, like a word, and I'll remember, go back to that. I might be doing checks as I go through the bullet points, like, got that, got that. Um, I might write a star, like, I don't have that yet, come back to that later when there's a lull. Um, so, so whatever sheet I have in front of me, it's a mess by the end of an interview. Um, but that's because I'm not really reading it while I scribble on it. Yeah. You mentioned that you sometimes you're, you're like, oh, I got the beginning of that sentence. I need to get the end of that sentence. How often are you splicing sentences together, rearranging thoughts, and then putting them back in order in the yeah. edit? Often. Um, it's part of what we do. Um, and I tend to, so far, most of my work tends to be documentary work where I'm not just locked on an A and a B camera. I'm, I, I prefer to use just one camera. And instead of a second angle, I would rather show you something else. Uh, show you the verite we shot or show you something archival, just show you something different. So that gives me freedom to chop it all up. Um, this isn't a technical answer, but it, it's, it's more of a, it's more of an ethical answer. Uh, I, I always feel it incumbent upon me to um, just be true to the meaning of whatever the person was saying. Um, I clean people up. I take out, I take out ums. Uh, there's a certain point at which you want to be on somebody and get that natural character of finding words. But for a lot of it, you want to help them sound their best. And also I want to sort of get through an edit efficiently. If I have a lot of runtime, don't have much runtime and a lot of stuff to fit in, I'm going to make things as concise and succinct and to the point as possible. I want them to sound like they it's good writing, as it were. Um, but I will never, I, I may put some syntax in somebody's mouth, create a rejoinder or something where I can connect some thoughts, but I will never betray the essence of what the person was getting at. Um, that's a little bit of a gray area, admittedly, but I've, I've, I've always taken it seriously and never have I had anybody follow up with me and say, that's not what I said. Um, I, I, I do have stories from being an editor where a director asked me to do something like that, <laughs> and uh, I think I refused on, on all counts. Um, but as long as you're true to what the sense of the conversation was, I, I think you're on pretty firm uh, journalistic grounds there. You also say that, you know, it's it's good to seem like you're having a conversation, but when you are recording it for an interview in order to edit later, you as the interviewer, you can't give verbal affirmations. You can't just be like, uh-huh, yeah, oh yeah, totally, because that'll right. get into the sound. So it right. is a little bit unnatural, I find, in yeah. that you're always kind of doing the most with your body language, just being like, yes, I understand you. Yes, that's right. right. <laughs> Yeah, it can feel unnatural. Um, I think you, you're, the more you do it, the more uh, reflexive that becomes and the more natural that kind of body language will feel. You'll get, you'll find some ticks. I mean, there, are, there is a kind of interview style where you, you know, the interviewer is a character, like, you know, Gail King, we see her on screen. You and I right now are both characters in this interview. So people are seeing you and I nodding to each other. Um, but yeah, for sure, if you're not, a voice that if, if your audio is going to get in the way of their audio and you're cut out, you're not a character, which is how I do just about everything I do as an interviewer, then yeah, you've got to be good at shutting up. If I'm talking or asking questions and then they start to talk, I cut myself off right away. I very rarely will finish a thought. If they start to interject, I'll just let them go. Um, and to your point, you know, I'm just kind of going, or I might go like mouth the word, right. Or, you know, whatever, let's just like give them a signal that I'm listening. Uh, it's a lot of, a lot of eye contact and a lot of subtle nodding uh, whenever possible. Or maybe just something with a hand, you just be like, right, you know, like, I hear you, go on. Um, you'll find that rapport with an interviewee. All right. Well, I would like to um, leave with one last question. You have done quite a number of interviews with big profile people, people that you may only have 15 minutes with, like I do with you. So what is what is one tip that you can leave um, with us on how to interview high profile guests? Um, well, I hasten to add, you could have had more time with me. I don't, you've got a show I, format. Filled. Listen, the, the show format is what I'm okay. saying. It's you the show get, format. <laughs> you will get 15 minutes with Alex and no more. Um, yeah. Uh, Generally speaking, the more high profile the person, the, the people who are going to say you've got five minutes or you've got two questions or you've got 15, whatever that is. Um, 
are probably the ones who are better at being media trained anyway, and at least pretending to look very human, even if they're not. Um, so it's sort of, sort of just your job to get what you need. Um, same stuff, put them at ease, try to make them feel it's not gonna be too mechanical. I love starting with an icebreaker, whether it's somebody a very high profile or um, you know a, a, an average show, uh, have done some research about them so that you can start with, oh, by the way, I heard you, you were a, a high school football star, something that they're not expecting to be asked about. That just, you know, like when I interviewed Elizabeth Warren and I, I, I had this article about when her, um, her dog had died and she wrote an op-ed about loving dogs in Boston Globe. And I just started by naming her dog and talking about dogs and my dog. And she it just like kind of put her at ease, I think. Not that she wasn't going to be an easy interview. She does it all the time. But it's just a little something to get them to go, ah, I want to talk to this person. Um, that it's, it's a good little trick um, that helps. And then just be as targeted with your little time as you can be. Again, try not to be robotic. Try to have the questions whether you're reading them or they're memorized, have them come out conversationally. Always find the segue between them. Oh yeah, and that you know that reminds me of another thing. But you're just getting right to your next question. Just make it sound like it's the first time you've thought of this stuff, even if it's not. Yeah, you you have to kind of do some acting too, um, oh, for sure. For because you all. you may have researched the the heck out of this person, looked them up in their high school yearbook or whatever, and then just yeah. offhandedly you know all these all these things that relate to things that they know about. <laughs> Right, right, and you, you know, and they're going to know that you know what what's going on. But I also something something you didn't ask me about, but it, it pertains to the research question. You know, very often an interviewee has been pre-interviewed, or if they're high profile, you've just talked to their people. Well, what kind of stuff are you going to cover? I rarely, if ever, share questions in advance. If they demand it, I'll give them like bullet point topics. Um, but uh, I never do the pre-interviewing myself. If I'm fortunate enough to have a story producer or just a producer. Um, they're going to find out those things for me, um, mm. not because I'm not happy to do the work. I want to know what was in the pre-interview, but because when I sit down with the person, I want them to feel like they're telling me these things for the first time. I don't want us to have talked through it all on the phone already. Um, I'd like it to feel spontaneous. So, um, yeah, I think I hope that was helpful. Well, also because a lot of times when you have talked to someone, literally say that, oh, as we as we talked about before, or as I've told you before, and mm. they'll just repeat. And it's oh. not always, I think you, hold on, we might I'm have back, been. I'm back, I'm back. You froze, but I'm back. No, it was my internet that dropped out. I think the truck outside is actually the internet people <laughs> coming did, to did the both, die? both fix and kill my internet. I think yeah. it's back. Um, I was saying that, struggle to this. obviously, uh, I was just saying that um, a lot of times, what was I saying? Now I got so distracted. I I know what you, were say. you were gonna say, you know, if you've done a pre-interview, they, they'll be like, well, as I told you before. They will literally that. say that, yeah. A lot of times the, the guests will be like, well, as we discussed before, as I've already told you. And, and sometimes even yeah. in the same interview, I'll ask the same question yeah. different ways, just cause I'm trying to arrive at the, yeah. the, the answer or the format that I want them to answer it in. Right. And so I don't, I'll tell them like pretend you've never answered this before, right, right, right. and it, and they'll they'll have be well they'll have been well rehearsed. They've probably talked to people a lot about whatever the, their opinion is that you're asking them about or the story is. But especially if it's a storytelling kind of interview and they've got some personal narrative, like I want to be on the edge of my seat going, no, really? Like they, I want them to see that I'm hearing the story for the first time. I'm fully engaged in it. They'll have rehearsed it already, but I'm hearing it for the first time, or at least I want them to believe I am. So uh, that's again where you, like you said, it's it's a performance for me. Well, thanks, Alex, for these ace tips. Again, I wish I could talk to you for longer, but um, again, see, better. then I say I just said it. I just said it again because because I don't follow my own advice. Okay. So um, if people want to uh, follow you on the web or if they mm -hmm. want to see your work, I know that Autonomy is on Amazon Prime right mm -hmm. now, so people can watch it. Uh, where else can people go see your work? Um, Autonomy is also on Hulu, if you're not a Prime subscriber. Um, Hamilton's America, sadly, is technically in the vault right now, but um, I think something like 60 to 70% of it is available in clip format on educational website uh, pages on the PBS website. So if you just look for like learning materials, Hamilton's America on PBS, you'll see much of my film broken out with learning curriculum. Um, and I've got a, I got a, as I said, I've got a Bon Jovi music video up on the web. Uh, you can go to my website, uh, which is www.strange-case.com. 
And on Twitter, I'm at Alex underscore Horwitz, H-O-R-W-I-T-Z, one L. So whatever I work on, I post up there. Well, thanks so much, Alex, for for taking time to do this. Um, It was an honor and a pleasure. Likewise, my pleasure. I'll see you around. Bye. Bye. All right. So that was our uh, interview with Alex Horwitz. If you will allow me to just take a minute to reset up my setup for the tutorial portion. Again, if you would like the PDF with all of the info for this tutorial, you can go to adobe.ly slash tips Tuesday, and it'll be there for you. I just have to configure my monitor real quick because I changed over some settings from from last time. I have a new capture card because mine broke and died on the floor. So I have to just uh, switch over a few things. Also, I did not ask, where is everyone from? I would like to know if you could tell me where you're tuning in from that way, uh, whether you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube, I have both feeds pulled up that way I'll know um, where you're tuning in from. Today, our topic is how to edit interviews and I've edited quite a few interviews. The one that I'm showing you today is actually from a few years ago from 2017. I did a video for Dell, uh, the computer manufacturing company, and they have this program called their um, recycling take back program where you can recycle old computer parts doesn't matter if they're dell computer parts or not and they wanted to raise awareness for this program so we made a video about that and uh this is how where i'm going to show you that video hopefully the zoom tool works i think it does the uh little righty tool that i use on my screen should work if i can find where it is there we go okay there it's working cool everything's cool looks like we have people turn tuning in from portland from toronto from uh Mel- M- melbourne melbourne australia mexico city um costa rica that's awesome i'm so happy that everyone's here all right let's jump in so here i have my project and the way that i start all of my projects is that i make sure to organize all of my bins so here i have my footage bin my sound bin sequences graphics photos and exports sometimes i do have an exports bin just in case i need to export something and bring it back in so i'll put that in a separate exports bin now for footage i have you can see here it's numbered by the day that we shot because this was a this i mean we shot for what how many however many days that is and then each one has sub bins that are by camera over here and then you have the actual clips now this was in 2017 i wasn't uh naming my clips at the time but these days i would also have them batch renamed so for example if this was like b-roll i would say c001 underscore and i would write b-roll or if this was an interview i would write underscore and i would write what the what the interviewee's name is so that is kind of how i organized all this footage but let's let's work on an interview here and there's a couple of different ways that you can sync your footage with your sound in premiere pro there's actually three different ways so i'll go ahead and let's just pretend that i have named all these files by whoever the whoever the subject of the interview is so i'll type in sarah just notice that my bulbs aren't on well i could have even hold up watch this watch this wow why did I just notice that? So Alex Horwitz, um, he does one camera interviews. And if you only have one camera, then you can use this next tip for yourself. Oh, look at that, even more lights. You could use this, oh, sorry. I'm getting texts from the Adobe team. Um, I don't know what any of that is, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me go back. So if you have one camera, you can just select like, for example, the Sarah close-up. You can select that file right here. And then you can go down and select the Sarah voiceover file by holding down control or command. So now that they are both selected, you can merge the clips. So if you go to right click, 
And then you go to merge clips. This will work with one, uh, one audio file and one AV file, which is what we call audio video file, right? And then here you can give it a new name. So we can call it Sarah Synced One Camera. And then you can say remove audio from AV clip. So this will remove the audio from that audio video clip, leaving only the audio from the actual audio clip. And you can sync it by the channel, which is just audio, right? So that's how you would do one single camera with one single um with one single piece of audio, we have several. I'm going to select the audio and I will just drag that directly into my sequence. So there they are. You can see the audio here is, let me make it so that you can see it a little bit better. The audio here is in the green. We have the close up that's in the pink. And then we have the wide that is in the blue. So I can move them to different tracks then stack them on top of each other. And then where, when they are in this stack, I can go ahead and select all of them, right click and go to synchronize, which is very similar to merge clips, but it's for multiple video clips. And here I can say, I would like you to synchronize by on the waveforms themselves, like save lap that's happening across all three. That is a little peak in the waveform. So you can just go ahead and take those waveforms and line them up as best you can so that the peaks are close to matching. They probably won't match 100% of the time always because um, this, this video and this audio is measured in frames, right? And frames can only be right and either jump. Oh, that's actually pretty good, but you can't really get finer control. So if you want finer control, click up in this area right here, right click, and then go to show audio time units. And that'll give you finer control onto your timeline. You can now zoom in past the frame level and you can scooch them over. Make sure to uncheck the, um, the, uh, snapping right here because that'll give you like that full control so you can go ahead and if you uncheck snapping you can go and um like re like rearrange all these exactly the way that you want them to be so that's another way to do it another way to do it um again <laughs> another fourth way to do this is you can select the so let me let me get this out of here you can select both of the audios or both of the video files over here, the wide and the close up, and you can select the audio as well. So all three are selected before I drag them in. So this is without dragging them in. I can right click and go to create multi camera source sequence. And here it's very similar in that again, I am synchronizing them by the audio. But here, if I choose enumerate cameras, I will be able to swap the cameras um, between each other as I'm playing through the video. And even though I am not planning to cover the multi-camera source workflow on this stream, I would like to know whether or not you are interested in me covering it on another stream because it's a little bit more complex than what I'm getting into here. But if you are interested in working with the multi-cam workflow, perhaps with three or more cameras going at the same time, that's when it really shines and when it's really helpful. It's also really helpful if you are looking to then um, export this project for something like a, a sound mix, then this is the way that you would want to do it. So yeah, definitely let me know in the chat room if you are interested in that. Okay. But uh, let's just go back into Premiere and let's just say for the sake of time that we have synced all of our footage uh, here. So we have synced all our footage. You can see all of those waveforms are lined up right there. So let's just expand this a little bit so that you can see that the top is the close up and the bottom is the um, wide. We can mute these two tracks right here so that we don't see them or we, so that we don't hear them. 
uh, but they're still there just in case we need them as reference. I don't like to delete anything. I just like to have it there. So the only track that we're listening to is our main track over here. And now what we can do is we can kind of actually see just even using the waveform, we can see what's usable, what's not, where to cut, where not to cut, etc. We can also, something that I like to do, especially if I have files that are pretty massive, like 4K files, uh, I could either take the quality down to like one fourth over here so that they scrub through a little bit faster, or I will just hide the visibility on those video layers because right now I'm editing for context. I'm not really editing for the video. I'm just editing the audio for the context of what she's saying. So I'll go ahead and start and I'm gonna keep my fingers on a couple of different keys. The first key that I'm gonna keep my fingers on is the um, JKL keys, JKL. So JKL allows you to scrub, oh, the stream dropped for a second. So JKL basically means rewind, stop and fast forward. And if you press L twice, it'll fast forward even faster. If you press J twice, it'll rewind even faster. So that's one way that you can scrub through your timeline really quickly. I'm also gonna hold on to the Command K shortcut, Command K or Control K, because that's gonna allow me to cut all of my tracks like a, a sword down, down the center. So I can trim all of them at once right under the playhead. So that's Command K. Uh, just a note, Command K will only work if both of the um, track targeting is selected on both. So let's listen. Nothing thus me. far. Mm -hmm. All right. Great. Yay. You're welcome. How's your, being, how's your last few days been? One, wonderful. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm already. Yeah, stop oh. being nervous. Um, they have been, it's been fantastic. Yeah. Um, really, really interesting. So this is kind of, oh, there's a siren outside. Wonderful. Welcome to Los Angeles. This is kind of where the interviewer is, is buttering up the, the subject and he's just trying to get her comfortable. So how's your day been? How are you? All of that. I don't need any of that. We're going to pause for this siren and just have like a Yes, I live in the city. Yes. Okay. So this is the kind of stuff that you can definitely JKL your way through. Scrub through. There we go. Um, it's been fun. How have you been? Oh, looks like uh, my stream might have dropped from the Facebook. I... I don't know how to start it again. I don't know how. So I guess we're just stuck on the YouTube. Um, okay. <laughs> so it looks like he uh, he did ask a question panel, somewhere in here. And uh, we got introduced to each other. Mm -hmm. And from there, we just kind of hit off and having passion for... Clean nope, none of that is important. It really wasn't difficult to, to convince them because obviously um, these are... I mean, we started the closed loop process. Okay, there we go. You guys have been working together like forever? How For a pretty long time. Yeah. So right there is where I want to insert my first cut. Right there. Now, um, as I'm scrubbing through, you can see that it is automatically selecting the top clip. If I don't want it to automatically select the top clip, because right now if I press Command K, uh, with the top clip selected, it'll only cut through the top clip. So one of the things that I could do for it to cut through everything is if I press shift command K, it'll cut through everything. Or I can go over here to sequence and deselect selection follows playhead, which means that as I scrub through, it's not going to select the top clip. And then I can just simply do command K. And then I'll delete that by going to command D and I'll ripple delete that. So that's where it starts really. I mean, we started the closed loop process with them in 2014 after you know pilot process and feasibility studies and lots of different um, things that we did but uh but yeah it's been it's been quite a few quite a long time so we're people quite a long time so 
So I'll cut that off. And you can see there's a bunch of other stuff in there. Um, she says, um, a lot. And that's, that's some things I can cut out as well. But not right now. For my first pass, I'm not going to be cutting out all the ums and uhs. I'm just going to go through and see if I can cut as much as possible out. So, um... The close through process, um, the the process um, I can also, if I want to get rid of everything between the, uh, between the playhead right here, between the playhead and the beginning of the clip, I'll just press Q on my keyboard and that'll get rid of everything. And I can also just see what I want to get rid of because of the waveform. I know that her next question starts right here. So I'll place my playhead there and I'll press Q. The closed loop process um, involves taking materials that we collect or recover from our recycling programs and uh, reusing them back to make new computer parts. So I'll do Command-K. In our uh, product lines. Okay, that I'll, I'll get rid of that and I'll add the in our product lines. There's some noise. I'll get back to, okay, this looks like she starts right here. So we started the closed loop process um, with Wistron in 2014. So I'll do the right at we. We started the closed loop process um, with Wistron in 2014. We actually launched it after our feasibility studies and our pilot program, which was successful um, for plastic specifically. Mm -hmm. And we were using the supply streams coming in through our Dell Reconnect program. So, and I'll put place a cut. So let, let's, I think that's fully understood that that's what I'm gonna do for the rest of the thing. So I don't have to do it here. What I'll do is um, let's go back to the beginning and let's just pretend that now everything's cut up. So I'll just get rid of this. That everything's cut up. I'm going to do my next pass at this, right? But I don't want to lose the work that I've done here because maybe I would need to go back to this and check it again. Or maybe the client wants to see the full cut for some reason. So instead of starting the new like refined cuts on this one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click up here at the name of the sequence which is Sarah Interview Synced, I'm going to right click and go to Reveal Sequence in Project because I can obviously go find it in my project here. Uh, it's probably under Sequences, it's over here somewhere in, in the sequences, but a quick way to do it if you have a lot of media is you can just right click and go to Reveal Sequence in Project and it'll reveal it right here, Sarah Interview Synced. So I'm going to right click and I'm going to go to Duplicate and now this duplicated sequence, I can click on it and I can give it a new name. So I'm going to name it cut one. Sarah interview cut one. And then right now the synced one is the one that's still open. So if I want to open up cut one, I'll just double click on double click on the icon. So now I am inside Sarah interview cut one. I can go ahead and close the Sarah interview synced so that I can start working on Sarah interview cut one for that more refined cut. So now let's go in and actually now I can I can turn on my um, my visibility so I can see both and I'll go ahead and do a more refined cut. I mean we started the closed loop process with them in 2014 after you know pilot process and feasibility studies and lots of different um, things that we did but uh, but yeah it's been it's been quite a few quite a long time the closed loop process maybe i don't want that at all so i'll just command d and ripple delete it the closed loop process um so here she says um right so i'll put my playhead right at the beginning of the word um and i'll do command k i'll put my playhead right at the end of the word um and i'll do a q the loop process involves taking materials that we collect or recover from our recycling programs and uh, reusing them back to make new computer parts in our uh, product lines. So here she does like a big pause and I can get rid of that pause as well. I'll do command K. I'll move this forward and I'll do Q again. And then she does another um. In our uh, product. The uh. So I'll cut out the uh where you can actually see it physically on the waveform, right? So I'll place my playhead there, Command K, and then I'll cut that. Our product lines. We started the closed loop process um, with Wistron. 
this, um, Again, there's another um, so I'll do command K at the end of it. And to cut out the, the whole um, I'll place my playhead there and I'll press W. Process with Wistron in 2014. We actually launched it after our feasibility studies and our pilot program, which was successful um, for plastic specifically. Mm -hmm. And we were using the supply streams coming in through our Dell Reconnect program. And I don't like the end of that, so I'll just end it specifically. specifically. And now this entire paragraph, this entire section, I actually want to move in front, right? Because she describes how they started it and then she describes it. So what I want to do is I'll select. We I'll select these two clips here and I want to move them here. But if I move them over to the beginning, what happens is that it overrides on top of those clips and I don't want it to override. So I'll select all of them and I'll hold down the um, hold on. It's the option and control keys at the same time. And that'll actually do this ripple switch where I'll ripple switch it so that now that beginning paragraph is at the beginning and this is at the end. We started the closed loop process with Wistron in 2014. We actually launched it after our feasibility studies and our pilot program, which was successful um, for plastic specifically. The closed loop process involves taking materials that we collect or recover from our recycling programs and uh, reusing them back to make new computer parts in our product lines. So this needs a little bit. New computer part in. Okay, it's fine. So as you can see now, um, it's the same. There's a lot of jump cuts and sometimes jump cuts are fine if you're doing it for YouTube. But if you want to then put this on um, Netflix or something on TV, jump cuts are not OK. So one thing you can do is you can select every other top clip here by holding down uh, shift alt right? And you can disable it by going to shift E. So now it toggles between the close up and the wide. We started the closed loop process with Wistron in 2014. We actually launched it. After so it looks like she is just having the same thought. Uh, it's just a continuation of the thought without anything cut out of the sentence. And you can even add more of those cuts in between here on that close-up clip so it gives that illusion even more that oh we're just simply switching between camera and camera we're not uh we're not cutting this up no no that's not that's not what we're doing so let, let's find a logical cut point where we can add that i see one here already i can see that this section right here just by using the waveform i can see that this section right here is a section that we would want to cut up so i'll just take uh my 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 um i always forget what this tool is called my razor tool and i'll razor like right here and right here on the top clip then i'll select it with going back to v and i will enable it with shift e so now it looks like this started the closed loop process with Wistron in 2014. We actually launched it after our feasibility studies and our pilot program, which was successful um, for plastic specifically. The closed loop process involves taking materials that we collect or recover from our recycling programs. And I can actually maybe I'll, I'll insert that cut here again. And now what I want to do is I want to make this section visible. I want to make this section hidden and I want to make this section visible. So I can do that all in one. I'll just select the whole thing as a marquee box, all three clips, and I'll do shift E and that flips which clip is enabled, which clip is disabled from our recycling programs and uh, reusing them back to make new computer part in our product lines. Now, we this looks good so far. The one thing I will say is it's kind of weird to be switching cameras at the end for just one word, right? In our product lines, why logically it doesn't make sense to be switching from camera to camera three times in the same sentence like this, right? On, off, on. But we had to do it because we had to cut up the sentence to make it make more sense and make it flow better. So 
you know, one one solid trick is to just cover it with B-roll. So if you put B-roll on top of all three clips, then you can't really tell that it wasn't the same thought, that it was from, you know, different parts of the same sentence. So one thing that you can do when you are doing B-roll is create a B-roll um, string out. So I'll go over here to my folder organization and you can see I have the footage here. And if I open up footage, I have all of these folders of footage, right? And I'll go into each folder and I'll see that there's even more folders. I can go into each folder and here are the footage clips. I can go into each one and I start seeing the thumbnails. I can pull them up. I can go over here. I can set in and out points by pressing I and O on my keyboard. So I'll like go over here. I'll set in in point where I want it to be an out point, then I can go over here underneath to drag video only, and I can drag that video over the edge here, and here it is. I'll turn snapping back on so that it snaps to the edge. So I could do something like that, um, but that is just guesswork, right? That is just, okay, I have hundreds, potentially thousands of little clips here that I could use, and I, what am I going to be like looking through each clip and picking out the best sections for my main working sequence? No, I'm not going to be doing that. So what I do is I do go over all these clips separately, like on a separate day, I'll go through and I will make string outs. So here you can see in the sequences folder or in the sequences bin, I have another bin. These are all the drafts. Uh, these are all the interviews called, let's see, is it here? Is it here? It should be here string outs. And I have a bunch of string outs. So for every single day of the shoot, I'll make a string out of all of the best footage. So for example, 1203, let's go to that string out. And this is the string out from that day. The string out itself is over 10 hours long, but this is all of the best footage from that uh, particular, from all of the B-roll clips on that particular day. And I also will do string outs by day and string outs by project. So there were three projects that we were doing behind the scenes of in here. So I can either look up my string out that I did by day where all of this is organized by the day that we shot each, um, the day that we shot each section. And what I've done is all of the best string out footage I've put on track two. So I know that that's the kind of, st that's the stuff that is the meatiest. That's the stuff that I want to use. And I also did a full string out by project. So this is like, I've organized this with, this is B-roll from Wistron. This is general prep for our project. This is the circuit boards project. This is the keyboards project. This is the laptops project. Because at the end of the day, what we did was we made four videos. We made one video just about circuit boards. We made one video just about keyboards. We made one video just about laptops. And then we made a general video. So what I can do is here, I know that this is B-roll from Wistron and this is what I need, right? So everything else I can, I can close up here. And I'll just pull the clips directly from the the B the best B roll that I've already strung out in a separate sequence, the Wistron B roll right here, the the purple, into that interview. So I'll take that interview that I was working on, and I'll take the name of it, and I'll pancake it underneath the full string out by project over here. So now I can see clips from both. And I can really pad out this interview clip with with that B-roll very simply. So what I'll do is I will go through the I'll go through the B-roll. I can scrub through it really quickly. You know, I see like the general. This is what the area looks like. Uh, these are the workers pulling stuff in, and I I can just start placing it, and I can cover up some of these cuts. We started the closed loop process. So even at the very beginning, I can place a, I can place a clip. Like she says, we started the closed loop process. This looks like a, this looks like something that could represent the closed loop process. So I'll pull that in and I'll make, I'll, I'll zoom in again to cover that entire, I'll, I won't zoom in. I mean, I'll change the rate. So I'll, I'll um, switch my rate. I'll turn on my rate stretch tool with R and I'll make it faster to cover up that entire section. So she says, 
We started the closed loop process with Wistron in 2014. With Wistron in 2014. So maybe I want to show her close up in that section. So I'll do command K and I'll enable shift E. I'll enable the close up. In 2014. And then maybe during this close up is when I'll put the lower third of her name, Sarah and who she works for. And then over on this switch over, I'll, I'll put more B roll on top of it. We actually launched it after our feasibility studies. Yeah, feasibility studies, her talking about it is not as interesting as all this B-roll that I'll include. So, and you can see that I'm locking the B-roll voice track because maybe I'll need it for later, but for now I don't want to drag it in. So I'll just lock it. So she's talking about feasibility studies. Maybe I'll, I'll do this clip right here over that. And then I'll do a few more. Maybe I'll do this clip right here. That could look like maybe this woman is actually the one whose hands are doing this work. So I'll I'll do that. And I'll make sure that whatever's in the background is active. There we go. And I'll place that kind of, I'll, I'll, I'll cheat it and I won't place it exactly at the cut because I don't wanna accentuate the cut. So I'll place it a little bit forward in the cut and then that way it doesn't accentuate that there's an extra cut there. 14. We actually launched it after our feasibility. After our feasibility studies, maybe we'll do something else. We'll drop that in. Let's see. That's another good one to drop in right there. Okay. Let me find the most. That's pretty active. That's a pretty active section there. Okay. And remember at the end where that sentence was a little bit chopped up, we'll put something there as well new computer part in our product lines C computer part i think there's an extra syllable that's missing in yeah computer, computer parts. parts in and we'll computer parts in our product lines we'll probably do let's see Ooh, the warehouse yeah so we flew the drone in the warehouse and that is kind of what maybe that maybe we want that section okay we'll we'll drag that in here cool so I'll go ahead and put this back. So now it's not pancaked anymore. And what I'll do is I'll render this out. So I'll go to sequence, render into out, just so I can play it back for you so you can see it a little bit more clearly. I don't know where my render window is. It'll take just a second. If you have any questions, unfortunately the, um, the, the, the Facebook feed went out, but the feed on, YouTube is still good. All right, this is done. So let's take a look at what our video looks like for now. So I'll try to I'll try to keep the both the um, both the video on the screen for you and the the audio here, both the video and the the preview. There we go. We started the closed loop process with Wistron in 2014. We actually launched it after our feasibility studies and our pilot program, which was successful um, for plastic specifically. The closed loop process involves taking materials that we collect. Oh, I'll do one more. I'll do one more because I'm a glutton for, I love B-roll. So I'll, I'll, I'll put in one more piece of B-roll. Um, yeah, I'll do this of him throwing it. So I'll just go uh, copy. Uh, command C and I'll go back to her her interview here and now if I do command V because I want to cover up this kind of awkward transition here if I do command V what will happen is it'll put that clip on the first video layer and I don't want that right I want that clip to go on the third video layer so I'll undo that command Z and instead what I'll do is I'll turn on source patching. So I'll turn on source patching for the V3 row. So now if I do command V, it'll go onto the third row here. And I'll choose the section that's the most active of the guy actually throwing the thing. There we go. And again, I don't want to accentuate these cut lines. So I'll start the and end the, the clip not on the cut lines themselves. So now it, it'll look like this.
program, which was successful um, for plastic specifically. The closed loop process involves taking materials that we collect or recover from our recycling programs and uh, reusing them back to make new computer parts in our product lines. Okay, so that sounds good. The only thing is because I cut everything up and kind of made it choppy and changed the order of things, you can see that there's a little bit of like, like a, like a, like a stop at the end of every single one of the, of the audio bits. Like there's a little bit of a, how would you say it? It's kind of just like, it's, it's an awkward transition that's happening right here at every single cut point, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to smooth that out. So imagine that this is an interview that's like 20 minutes long, right? You're not going to put a little ramp in between every single one manually. So let's do it automatically. Let's go to the effects over here. And I have it in favorites, but if you just type in um, constant power, that effect is, excuse me, under audio transitions, crossfade constant power. And we just drag the constant power effect onto the first transition. And you can see by default, if you go here into effect controls, by default, the duration is four seconds. Now you can always change the default duration of your, of anything really of the photos you put in or whatever. But in this case, it doesn't really matter. So I'm just going to make it smaller so that it is only, I just want a, like a very casual, fast transition. And I'll zoom in on it so you can see that it is only two frames long. That's it, right? And I'll copy it by going to Command C. And then what I'll do is I'll select all of these cut points at once by holding down Alt and dragging a marquee box around them. So I'll select the other four cut points and I'll go Command V and I'll paste them in there. And now as we listen through to it, you'll be able to hear that those like little blips are gone and it sounds like a complete sentence. It sounds like she's saying two complete sentences. We started the closed loop process with Wistron in 2014. We actually launched it after our feasibility studies and our pilot. Actually, it looks like there, she hits her necklace or something here. With so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just cut it a little bit earlier. So I'm going to place that cut just one frame over. And this is pretty simple. I just do Q again. Oh, make sure that this is, these are all selected. I'll just do Q again and that that keeps the transition, but it gets rid of that one frame where it sounds like she hit her necklace on something. Process with Wistron in 2014. We actually launched it after our- Sorry, that was me pausing. Let's try that again. We started the closed loop process with Wistron in 2014. We actually launched it after our feasibility studies and our pilot program, which was successful um, for plastic specifically. The closed loop process involves taking materials that we collect uh, maybe I'll show the I'll show the wide for a little bit longer. It was a little bit um, it was a little bit quick, which was successful um, for plastic specifically. The closed loop process involves taking materials that we collect or recover from our recycling programs and uh, reusing them back to make new computer parts in our product lines. So you see how that was just like very very smooth, very good. All right. So the, the last thing I know we're we're past our time limit here, but the last thing I want to show you is a little bit about how to nest and give a, a similar treatment to your photos. Okay, so if you go to, so let's go to like, like the full video, for example. So I have this full video and it looks like this. There's, there's this section in it that looks like this. Where we're talking, this is, we're, we're talking about um, the final that we did for this campaign. Piece by piece, our structure slowly started coming to life, just like a new laptop born from recycled parts. From there, all that remained was to add the human component, representing the everyday person, the most important part of the recycling machine. All the pieces we use. So it's the everyday person, the most important part of the recycling machine. We go from this kind of setup here we zoom into her face. Let me actually mute this so you can't hear it. We zoom into her. Is there another me? Is there another thing? Okay. There we go. We zoom into her face. Zoom. And then we want to go from her face to the photo. And then there's three photos that we want to put into this empty space here. And then it goes into this kind of um, 
this setup, which is one of our one of our photography setups. So I'll go back to my uh, project here and I'll go into the photos and I'll try to find the three photos that we want to put in. So we'll we'll go to photos. We want to show our final photos, final photos. And here are the three photos. So let's take a look at them, what they are. The first one looks like this. So this photo aligns with this setup. So that's the photo that we want to put last here on our little timeline. Then this photo right here, this this one, it aligns to this setup with her makeup being done, that they are active photos, right? That there's some movement to them, that they're not static. So what I want to do is include a zoom throughout all of the photos so that there's a little bit more movement happening. And But the problem is that they're all static, right? At, when I put the photos in themselves, they're all static. So that's one issue. The other issue is that the photo files themselves are huge. They're much bigger than the 1920 by 1080 sequence. In fact, if I look over here into, well, it says video info, but it's really just clip info. I can see that the dimensions of each photo are like over 7,000 by almost 5,000. Some of them are over 5,000. So it's just going to be difficult to change the scaling of all the photos at once. They're not the same sizes as each other. They're not the same sizes as the sequence. So what do I do? Well, I'll nest these photos and that'll solve my issue. So I'll select all three photos. Nesting basically creates a new sequence that just contains those assets in it. And then it's kind of like a Russian nesting doll, right? Oh, a nest, a Russian nesting doll. Did I just figure this out? Is that why it's called nesting? Okay, mind blown. But yeah, that's what it is. So we'll select all of them by dragging a marquee box, right click, and then go to nest. So we'll name our nest and we'll say three, five. Oh no. <sighs> Give it a sec to go again. So what I've done is I've actually made this subsequence a little bit too short. Um, let me show it to you here. So I've made the subsequence or the the nest a little too short, right? So what I'll do is uh, let's go in and out. I need it to be five seconds long. So I'll go into here, and around five seconds is where I want the photos. To be so I'll make this longer by five seconds oh I'll make this five seconds so then I go back to my sequence here and I can see now I have more to play with in that uh, nested sequence it actually should be longer than five seconds so I'll make it even longer I'll add some more length to it so you can always change what's inside of that nested sequence if you want let's clear this in and out so there we go. So it goes from her face to, I think I lost the little zoom effect. That's okay. I'll find it again. I think I deleted it. This is why I make different versions, right? So I'll go reveal sequence in project, draft 17 for demo. I'll go back to draft 17 and I'll grab that little zoom clip from there. This is why I make different versions. So over here, let's pop it in. There it is. So it goes from the zoom into the face. Now I want it to zoom into the photo or zoom out from the photo. Let's see, zoom in and then zoom out. So I will go over here about four frames into my nested sequence. I'll go to effect controls and I'll set the scale to kind of where I want it. And I'll set the position to where I want it there. And I will enable the, I'll toggle on the animation controls for both. Then I'll go back to the very beginning of that nest, right where it cuts from the face shot, and I'll zoom in and rearrange a little bit. So it goes from face and then like that, but then it's again, it's steady now. So I have to give it a little bit of motion. So I'll go to the very end of my nest, which is around here and I'll place my playhead near the end and I will do a little zoom zoom out on the full image here and I'll reframe it slightly. 
So now I have something that looks like this. It's going to be a little bit slow because my computer's processing a huge file. So let me render it for you so you can see it. It'll just take a few seconds more to render it. Three, two, one. So it goes in, it goes out. And now there is that motion throughout the entire range of photos and they are no longer immobile. I am cutting off that top of the middle photo a little bit so I can go back into my sequence here and I can reposition my middle photo a little bit down so that when I go back into my sequence here, you can see that it's not cut off anymore. I can, I can do it a little bit lower, I think, still. So we see that computer in the air because this is for Dell. So um, there we go. Yeah, and yeah. Oh, I can still see a little bit of the black. So I'll shift it up a little bit. Okay, and let me render that in to out. And you'll be able to see the final. So we zoom in, we zoom out. It keeps going, keeps going, shows all three photos through a consistent zoom. That is all that I have for you. If you would like to review this, it's going to be up on the Adobe Care channel as well as over here at adobe.ly slash tips Tuesday, where you will be able to see all of the manuals, not only for this week, but also for the 21 weeks prior that I've been doing this or 20 weeks prior. I guess this is the 21st week. So definitely go and check that out. Until next week, my name is Valentina V. It was so lovely um, hanging out with you. And despite the garbage truck outside, I had a lovely conversation with Alex Horowitz. I want to thank him for joining me this week. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day and goodbye.